On a hill in Hambury lies the grave of a war hero. An old Edwardian, a father, the recipient of two military crosses. But unlike those who fell beside him in combat, this man's headstone isn't in a war cemetery. His name isn't on any war memorials. His is a different story. This is the story of John Osborne Walford. Stories like Wolford's are part of every family's history or a huge amount of family's history. The story started when, 15 years ago, my mother produced this leather box and said, I think inside it is an MC. And I opened it and I said, I think this is two MCs. Whose is this? I don't think it can be your father's. And she said, no, I think it was my grandfather's. And I said, but he would have been almost 50. He wouldn't have got an MC. On investigation, it became obvious that it was John Osborne Walford's MCs that he won in the advance of the final 100 days of the war. It was the beginning of, of the sort of wild goose chase to discover his story and to find out what he achieved as a man uh, and ultimately his tragic end. Born in 1869 in Edgbaston, John Osborne Walford attended King Edward's School in Birmingham. Little is known about his time there, but much of his early adulthood was spent in the hunting fields, on the golf courses and around the billiard tables of Worcestershire. He was a countryman through and through. His military career began at the age of 30 as a second lieutenant in the Royal Warwickshire Regiment. Within three years he had resigned his commission and moved to the Gold Coast, Africa, leaving behind his wife and only child. It is not until 1914, some 12 years later, after the outbreak of the war, that Walford's story really begins. Despite being 45, he volunteers to rejoin the army. I think he had slightly lost his way perhaps at home. He'd come back from Africa, we think. He'd been in the army previously, and I think he just felt it was his time to help. His uncle raised an additional battalion to join the war effort from the county of Worcestershire. It was a county regiment and very local to where he was brought up. And I'm sure that all the locals would have joined up together, a bit like the subsequent PALS battalions. As an older officer, he could easily have opted for a staff job far from the front line. But Walford intends to lead his fellow countrymen into battle as a captain and company commander. To go off and take a staff job would have been the sort of easy way out. And from all we subsequently learnt, that wasn't the route that he would take in life. He was a, a soldier and a local countryman, and he wanted to be with his friends and local countrymen. Walford and his battalion do not cross over to France until May 1916, but they will encounter several major actions in the coming months. Over the next two years, Walford will lead his men at the Battle of Ober Ridge, reinforce lost troops at Passchendaele, hold trenches at Vimy Ridge, and contract trench fever and malaria. He will be posted to the front lines in Italy and take part in the Battle of Pieve, before finally returning to France in 1918. In the two years since he arrived in France, the war has changed dramatically. Walford rewrites his will in preparation. He is 49 years old. By 1918, the Great War had assumed a new and terrible nature. Both sides were using weapons of mass destruction in the form of poison gas. 
Unrestricted submarine warfare meant that hospital ships carrying wounded soldiers could be sunk on site. Civilians in Germany were being slowly starved to death because of the British naval blockade. And both sides had developed heavy bombers so they could target civilians in their beds in London and Cologne. Germany, having secured its place in the east, could now transfer hundreds of thousands of troops to the Western Front. This was a matter of urgency. They needed to strike at the West before large numbers of American troops arrived in Europe. The Germans had brilliant success early on. Five different battles meant a breakthrough in the West. They very nearly won the war. Commander-in-chief of the British forces, Haig, talked of our backs to the wall. One last desperate effort to save the situation before a German victory. But the Germans have been too ambitious and become victims of their own success. They advance too far, too quickly. They overstretch their lines of supply, come out from the cover provided by their own artillery. And in the summer of 1918, the Allies are able to counterattack, with vital support from the Americans. I'm here in the American cemetery at Bonny. And it's here that the Americans are going to make a vital contribution, acting in concert with the British, the French, the Australians, the Canadians in breaking the Hindenburg Line. By the end of the war, in November 1918, 1 1.2 million American troops would be fighting on the battlefields of the Western Front and making a key contribution. Walford and the Worcestershires will in fact fight side by side with the Americans. It's very unlikely that the Allies could have won in 1918 without American help. The Battle of Amiens on the 8th of August became known as the Black Day of the German army, with huge numbers surrendering to the Allies. From then on, for the next 100 days, the Allies struck hard. Walford would lead his men in the thick of this push. On October 5th, he and his battalion are staged, poised for an attack on the German stronghold village of Beaurevoir. Behind me is the village of Beaurevoir. You have to try and imagine it in early October 1918. It's a heavily fortified village. It's part of the famous Hindenburg Line. And since mid-September, the Allies have been pounding away at it, trying to break through. Two earlier attempts to take the village have failed. The Worcestershires are forming up in the valley behind me. It's their turn to go in. Dusk is falling. The sky to the north is crimson as the town of Combray burns. The artillery fire is about to open up. Will they succeed? His job was to coordinate that attack. He was the coordinating figure of that action for his 120 men, and that is not coordinating from the back, it's leading from the front. The officers crept forward to the crest of the ridge and made final preparations for the attack. Dusk closed in. The British artillery opened a barrage fire. The two battalions sprang to their feet and advanced rapidly and pushed forward. The enemy's guns were firing. The eager advance brought the leading platoons to the line of the British barrage, and for some little time, minutes count as hours in battle, the companies had to lie and wait in the open. As they lay, they were swept by machine gun bullets and casualties became numerous. That wait in the open under fire might have had bad effects on less seasoned troops, but the first 8th Worcestershire were now old in war. As soon as the British guns lifted their fire, the platoon again advanced. He, Big Six Foot Two, was very visible in all this, which would have been worrisome for him, but very reassuring for his men to see that the, that the old gent, as he was referred to, the big man, was there at the front and still going forward. And if the officers were going forward, the soldiers, British soldiers, always went forward with them. C Company came under sharp fire from machine guns on the left flank. The two leading platoons suffered heavy loss, but Captain J. O. Walford and his men pushed on bravely and soon gained their objective. The fighting once they were into the village was something that was completely new to them. They had to clear every building. It wasn't worried about machine gun and running through fire and, and, and shells. It was clearing buildings, building by building, cellar by cellar. And this was their first experience of doing that. We recently received a letter that he wrote to his uncle and he referred to this battle and he's very proud of himself. He, he feels he's done well. I can assure you it was a very anxious time. Pitch dark in a village I did not know anything about. We didn't know which was our line and which was the Huns. In fact, we ran into one of their patrols and took them prisoners. 
would he win a military cross or something for his actions. He didn't in this action, but his time would come. The attack is successful. Over 200 of the enemy are captured. The losses of the battalion total 140. Nearly all the German frontline defences have now been won, and the enemy's front is on the verge of giving way. The Allies advance rapidly. This obscure patch of ground might not look very much, but it is in fact proof that the Allies were going to win the war. It's all that's left of a railway station at the village of Honchy. Now Honchy is a good 13 miles from the village of Beaurevoir. Walford and the Worcestershires had captured Beaurevoir on the 5th of October. In three or four days they're here. That gives some sense of the speed of advance that the Allies are now making. There was no doubt at all that the Hindenburg Line had been broken. The Allies were very close to winning the war. Walford is now a veteran of war. His two years' experience leading men on the front lines of the fight are about to show. The battalion's next objective will demonstrate his leadership and initiative in a remarkable act of bravery. It's the 18th of October, 1918. It's half past two in the morning. The Worcestershires have been tasked with attacking the village of Buswell. But in thick mist, the formation breaks up. They encounter heavy machine gun fire. They're even being fired at point blank by field guns. There's a danger that the attack may fail. But at that point, Walford takes matters into his own hands. He captures a local horse, probably riding it bareback. He comes across this big open countryside from one crest to the other crest and tries to draw the enemy fire to identify where the enemy are. He's well ahead of his troops. He's on his horse. We know he's a big man and he's a big target. His confidence in front of his men must have been immense. It's brave to the point of foolhardiness. He had no real idea what he was going to encounter on his captured horse until he got there. But when he found out that the Germans could be attacked, he didn't hesitate, got his men together, and off he went. Despite his commanding officer calling for reinforcements, Walford scouts the objective, identifies weak defences, and takes it upon himself to order a frontal assault. The regimental diary talks about the Worcestershires going into battle behind a blaze of musketry with Lewis guns at their hip. And they very quickly overwhelm the German defenders. They captured artillery, horses, lumber, men. It was a very successful operation. The attack is such a success, and Walford plays such a key role, that he is awarded his first military cross. I think his award is very much his operation on his horse as a huntsman, crossing his own type of country, taking an enormous initiative not against commanding officer's orders, but just because he was at the front and the commanding officer at the back, he knew what the opportunities and the risks were. He'd had this extraordinary experience at Beauvoir, he'd had it at Anchy, he was a confident man, um, and he may have felt invincible, Im immortal in, in this, and that the guns may fire, but they wouldn't actually hit him. And he, his initiative meant the whole capture of the village. Remembering, it, it all sounds glorious, but seven men were killed, 46 were wounded in this escapade. Every time, and we're getting near the end of the war, tragic young lives were lost. Walford's behavior in combat is very interesting. He's uh, quite an old soldier. He's in his late 40s. Now, conscription by 1918 meant that men in their 50s could be called up to fight, but he's been around before. He was a peacetime soldier. And I think that preyed on his mind a little bit. His other brother officers were half his age, and I think he wanted to prove something to them. He's determined to do his bit. What's telling to me is that he rewrote his will in very simple form in August 1918, before going back to the front. I think he was determined really to put the best foot forward. He'd been given one last opportunity. The gallantry, the bravery element, is in part him trying to show to perhaps his brother officers and to himself that he's still an effective officer, someone to be taken seriously. And the regimental diary makes it very plain that his brother officers do actually respect him a great deal. It's entirely likely that the relationship between Walford and the younger officers was rather paternal. They, on average, would have been about 22, 23, and there he is basically twice their age. Walford is looked upon so fondly by his younger officers that they affectionately nickname him the Old Gent. 
I love the way they called him the old gent. I suspect he was finding himself amongst them and it was doing him good and he cared about them uh, probably more than he realised he was going to. He has the kindest heart in the world and is a thorough English gentleman in the best sense of the word. He has been more to me than one knows how to express since we've been in France. I don't remember anyone I would rather serve under. Wolfer probably came into his own. He'd had a, he'd had a troubled uh, life financially and, and with his marriage. And this was probably after 10 years, probably since his marriage, his marriage dissolved, and he'd fallen out with the, his siblings uh, over money. That he actually had people who cared for him and laughed at his jokes, uh, respected him uh, and felt a fondness for him. And he probably felt more loved in those years of 1916 to 1918 than he had for some time and really cared for them. And I think, you know, at the end, he repaid that love with his gallantry. In just over five weeks, Walford and his men have advanced 50 miles. A period of almost constant action has seen them face fierce battles along the route, through Beaurevoir, Anchy, and Baswell, where he won his military cross. The enemy's line is collapsing. The battalion are allowed a week of rest and training for a special task ahead, the final decisive action of the war, the crossing of the Sombre Canal at Londresy. This is the Sambra Canal in the town of Londresy, and in early November 1918, it was going to be the scene of the final battle against Germany on the Western Front. Wolford will lead one of three assault companies tasked with outflanking the town, but Londresy poses a significant obstacle. A 53-foot wide canal separates the Allies from their enemy. The bridges and locks have been mined and are impassable. Entrenching tools are swapped for life belts, and a dangerous amphibious assault is planned and practiced. On November 4th, the large-scale assault begins. Wolford and his men fight their way to the canal's edge. Wolford led C Company down this hill through that farmyard, past this German strong point to this very spot on the canal bank. Their job was to cross the canal under fire using improvised rafts made from petrol cans of all things, lashed together, designed to carry the weight of a 12-stone man. Walford is 15 stone and he's going to get very wet. That's the least of his problems because on the far bank are the German defenders. Allied aircraft had dropped smoke as well as high explosives onto the Germans to give some cover for the Worcestershires as they went into the water. The regimental diary talks about the water being whipped up by machine gun bullets as they cross over. It was clear the crossing would be a perilous business. The bullets were hitting all along the bank and were splashing into the surface of the water. But Captain Walford dashed forwards to the canal bank. His men hurried after him. The petrol tin rafts were set afloat. In those days, very few people I would estimate would have been able to swim. So the challenge of 50 foot of water out of their depth on the 4th of November, so bitterly cold, under fire, must have been a desperate action to undertake, extreme bravery. The German machine gunners would have been able to use the water to gauge their range. They could have seen the fall of shot. In no time at all, they'd have been able to train their guns exactly on the crossing point. So everyone in that company would have been as likely crossing under machine gun fire. The hail of German machine gun fire takes its toll, and casualties begin to mount. On reaching the other side, Walford arranges a rope and pulley system to get more men across, while his corporal provides covering fire. The platoon crosses, assembles and advances into the town. This daring flanking manoeuvre draws fire and presses the defence. The enemy, overrun by British forces, begin to surrender. The attack is a resounding success. The battalion captures 14 guns, 37 machine guns and 250 prisoners. On reflection, I think this must have been the most terrifying part of Walford's time on the Western Front. He's going to have to cross a canal under gunfire, and he's going to have to lead the way on improvised rafts. To 
put yourself out in the open like that, to expose yourself willingly to danger, is remarkable. But they do it. They get across, they suppress the enemy fire, they advance into the village, and they all assemble on a crossroads in the village, probably talking about what's just happened. And that crossroads has been pre-sighted by the Germans. A German mortar barrage targets the town, and Walford is wounded by shrapnel. But his actions in the assault and his leadership earn him his second military cross. In the last five weeks of the war, that battalion, which he, he was then part of, the 1st 8th Battalion of the Worcestershire Regiment, um, had an extraordinarily successful campaign. Uh, the divisional records and history mention them endlessly of how successful they were. And he was just part of a team. Between them, they got six DSOs and five MCs. They would always have said themselves, officers got their medals for the actions of their men. It was part of what all his fellow officers were doing, and I'm sure he would probably be embarrassed by those medals at the end of the time, that he, but that they were just representative of what his company and his battalion has achieved. Just seven days after the assault on Londresy, the war is over. Walford is sent home to recover. Although his physical scars heal, he is already battling wounds of a different kind. He continued to volunteer and went back as part of the army of occupation of the Ruhr, Ruhr area in Cologne. And it was there that he was uh, brought back to England, described in the uh, inquest report as for his own protection, um, under escort. Um, and that wasn't because he was going to be a danger to anyone else, but he was going to be a danger to himself. So it must have been recognised at the time that a relatively senior officer in charge of hundreds of men was struggling with everything he'd witnessed and everything he'd seen. And that he was at that age, 49. Um, so a rare, a rare being to be actually at the front uh, and to be under fire at that age. But all the time, the attrition of the young officers that joined his battalion, it was just as bad in the attacks over the last hundred days of the war as it was at the Somme. How awful it must have been for him and other people like him to see the young lives just going in front of him and no wonder they came back with problems. He came home to a country that his son was not in, he'd gone to India by then and his marriage was no longer there and I think the whole thing built up and we didn't understand in those days. He probably saw how lucky he was at the end when so many young, young subalterns who joined the regiment, something like 60 by my calculation, who joined either the 1st or 2nd, 8th battalions, uh, lost their lives before they were even promoted to captain. So before they were 22 or 23. And that's what he'd seen, and that's probably what ended his life. The horrors and staggering loss of young life Walford had witnessed did not leave him. In 1919, he spent time in a shell shock hospital, and in 1920, resigned his commission in the army. Although he made attempts to move forwards with his life, the brotherhood and belonging of military life was gone, and so too were many of the young men who served under him. Three years after the armistice, on the morning of the 21st of February, 1922, John Osborne Walford took a pistol into his brother-in-law's orchard and shot himself. If you're 49 and everyone around you aged 19 to 21 is being killed, you must wonder why, you know, that the whole flower of, of England has been under your command is being lost, must have had a terrible effect on all those officers. 
and of the six officers I referred to who won their DSOs and MCs so gallantly, Walford wasn't the only one who took his own life. One of the commanding officers in the 1930s took his life and his fellow company commander who was to win four different gallantry awards took his life in the 1950s. If you look at the local newspapers and how they report Walford's death, he's regarded as a war hero. He's won the military cross twice. He's a well-known figure in the community. Unfortunately, I think for his family, the stigma of suicide did stick. My grandfather's name was not mentioned. My father was quite an introverted pe person about things like that. It's very different now. It's a very different way of approaching it. Um, what we need to do is, is if people get to that stage uh, in their lives and they can't cope and they, they take their lives away, that we respect what they did and what they achieved in their lives and remember that and not just remember the way of their passing. He came from a background, a class in particular, that was stoic in nature and that they did not want to be seen to break down, to be weak in front of their men or the people that depended on them. So he bottled it up. A generation that didn't talk about trauma was by and large doomed in the end to fall victim to it as it returned. I think the most extraordinary thing was of the reports of the inquest is that his brother-in-law, Colonel Sydenham, who had fought a little bit further from the front, there is no reference to him having had any conversation with Walford, or Walford a conversation with him, about anything that was troubling them. They, through the mercy of God, has survived it all, but they didn't want to revive memories. In those days, you kept those sort of thoughts and how you were feeling to yourself. You didn't have somebody unless you had a very close friend. Normally, you just didn't have anyone to go to, and that must have made it much harder for them all. You hear so many people who said, my grandfather or my great uncle or whoever it was, never spoke about what happened. Um, when the war was over, the war was over and life carried, moved on and carried on. But for so many, it, it, they were unable to move on. And they ended up, in the worst cases, like Walford, um, by taking their own lives. But there would be many who suffered for decades afterwards, bottled up with the memories and the thoughts of what they'd seen and friends they'd lost, simply unable to talk about it, and no one really dare talk to them about it. I think Walford's trauma is going to be based in those crucial years of 1917 and 18. It is almost one long story of combat, and we can imagine industrialised warfare in all its horror. The one thing perhaps it's hard for us to actually grip is how noisy, how intense, how utterly terrifying the whole experience could be. We tend to see the war in shaky black and white images because that's all we have of them. But this was vivid technicolour, and two or three years exposure to that had to take its toll. The inquest into Walford's death determined his suicide to be the result of shell shock. The term came into use during the war to describe the debilitating symptoms displayed by some men exposed to heavy artillery barrages or fierce fighting. But little was known about the actual cause. As early as December 1914, 10% of officers and 4% of enlisted men were suffering from nervous and mental shock, and the number of shell shock cases escalated as the war continued. We can only guess at how it manifested itself with Walford. I don't think he had a complete physical breakdown. It was possible some victims did that. They forgot how to walk, and they had to be brought back to normal through occupational therapy, like basket weaving or leading a horse. But I think for Walford, it was more a trauma of the mind. I think that the, the breath of the guns had unnerved him, like it did many people, but he didn't have what was an obvious case of shell shock. Over time, it became clear that shell shock wasn't a physical injury, but an emotional one, a result of witnessing the untold horrors of war. By 1918, so many men were suffering from the condition that 19 British military hospitals were wholly devoted to its treatment. Ten years after the war, 
65,000 British veterans were still receiving care for their trauma. Today, the condition has a different title and is more deeply understood as post-traumatic stress disorder. The generation who fought in Afghanistan, in the Falklands, and served in peacekeeping in Northern Ireland. We need to look after them. Their troubles, on average, come up about 14 years after their actions. That's when the statistics show that they actually put their hand up and said, please, please, will you help? So we've still got a generation of soldiers and officers who we need to look after. I think it's our job, society's job, to make sure that they, they survive their experiences and that they go on to be happy and productive people who just don't happen to be soldiers anymore. Around one in five service personnel who experience combat develop post-traumatic stress. In the United States, it is estimated that 22 veterans take their lives every day, one every 65 minutes. In the UK, figures are much lower. Since 1998, 306 veterans have committed suicide. But this figure represents a steady decline as understanding, treatment and support have improved. Walford lived during a time where no such support existed and the reaction to suicide was very different. Those people who committed suicide were not allowed to be buried in churchyards, but he was lucky, if you can call it that, in that his great friend was a vicar and was determined he should at least have a service. Although, of course, we know he wasn't allowed to be buried in the churchyard, along with all the other people who committed suicide, the same thing applied. Finding the headstone of a decorated war veteran shouldn't have been hard but Walford's resting place was almost lost to history. It was interesting, the difficulty of finding records as to where he might be. Um, it took us some time to, to discover his grave, and most of the writing had disappeared. An inscription that was illegible, except for R.D. of Walford and F.E. of February. I did write to the powers that be in the ministries to see if, if he was entitled to a war grave. Um, but he took his life in February 1922 and the war uh, for such commemorations ended in August 1921. So no one like him is remembered on any village memorial and we'd be thrilled if somewhere beyond his grave that his name was added as a victim of the First World War. A memorial to the 245 old Edwardians killed during the First World War sits in the school's chapel. But due to the official end date of war commemorations in 1921, Walford's name isn't listed. Plans are in place for his name and other old Edwardians like him to finally be added to the Roll of Honour. All of his family would be um, delighted and very proud if his name was added to the memorial uh, here in the chapel at King Edward School. I'd be absolutely thrilled to see his name put on the memorial in the school chapel. I would feel he'd, it vindicated what he achieved. He didn't have to go to war, and he went, and he did his best, and I just, I'm very proud of him. Walford was one of many thousands who struggled with life after war but his story opens our eyes and minds to the internal battle that can follow combat and reminds us as individuals to broaden our understanding and awareness of mental health. Walford is a key story. He may not have been killed in the war, but ultimately he was killed by it. These days, mental health in all its facets is something that everyone pays attention to. So I think it's very, very beholden on us to think about Walford's story and what it teaches us about human nature in extreme circumstances. I think his is a voice from that generation that we really do need to listen to. And looking back 100 years ago, I think it's very important for us to acknowledge the debt that we owe people like that. Some men survived the war but couldn't cope with the peace. I feel very proud of him. I definitely would have liked to have known about his story when I was growing up. I wish I'd talked to my father about it because I think my father um, would have benefited from talking about it. Walford was part of a, a generation so many laid down their lives. 
All these stories just need to be told just to remind us of the tragic and staggering loss of life. That generation, they just took it as what they had to do. And I, I just implore every family to just to look back into that history and see however brave, and you don't have to get a military cross or anything else. They all put their heads above the parapet for this country, and we owe it to them to find out their stories. Walford's final resting place sits atop a picturesque hill in Hanbury, with an expansive view across the beautiful countryside he called home. As time has passed and views on suicide and war trauma have grown, so too has the boundary wall of the churchyard. Where once Walford lay outside the walls, now he lies within. And his incredible story, almost lost to time, has finally been told. I'm just the custodian of his medals. I think Pam and I have tried to do in the service of, of discovering his full story. And I trust that my children and their children will know the story and cherish what he did and honour his memory as we have tried to do.